Hello. In this clip from our Justia webinar, AI and Law, exploring 30-plus game-changing use cases in 60 minutes, Greg Siskin shares his final insights and thoughts while answering the audience's questions regarding the role of AI in the legal industry. If you'd like to see more Justia videos on law practice and legal marketing, be sure to subscribe to our channel. Tell people, so I mean, some people like are like, all right, where do I start with the, which tools do I use or how do I do this? Um, ChatGPT is one of probably about a half a dozen of major ones that are out there as far as public language models. Um, Google has theirs, it's called Gemini. Gemini is um you is incorporated into their browser um but you can also say gemini.google.com um meta has theirs um x elon musk's former twitter has a comp has a product called rock um there and and then there's uh microsoft has um bing's uh has a uh, ai product and then there are some smaller companies Claude is one that scores really well right now in some of the uh in, in some of the um the the uh um the the uh boards that actually measure performance. Claude I think is owned twenty five percent by Amazon, so they actually have some decent money behind them. Uh Perplexity, uh Poe, there's there's a there's a, a couple of these smaller companies, some of which are pretty good um on there. And then Mistral is a French company, but some of them charge, some of them are free. Um, keep in mind that sometimes paying us paying the twenty or thirty dollar a month fee uh, gets you some things that you might be really you know that might be really important for a lawyer. Um, one of which is privacy uh, on there. So some of these tools, um, if you get the paid version, um, you have a uh, they're, they're not training their models, and you can keep your um, your chats with them private. Um, some of them unlock certain features. Some of them have their higher performing models uh, in the pay version of it, so you'll get better answers. Um, but twenty to thirty dollars a month seems to be sort of the typical price that you would be paying for a public language model. The legal specific tools can be quite a bit more. Um, I think uh, you know you're looking at a um, you know, if you're looking at at, at K, a co counsel that which is from Case Tech, which is now owned by West, you know, you're probably looking at north of four or five hundred dollars a month per user. Uh, some of the tools are you know are less than that, but keep in mind the more specialized the tools, um, the more you're going to be paying for what you're using it for. So I'll stop there, um, and I think we can get into questions. I don't know if there if there are, and if anybody has sort of any super interesting use cases um we can share them in the uh questions as well and i'm looking now okay we already have five uh on here so um in the example of anonymization is it a confidentiality breach to upload sensitive information into gpt to begin with so the answer on that is it could be um an ethics breach uh to upload a document it depends on again what the terms of service are on the tool that you're using um, and what it's what it can do with that data. So, um, if you are using you know if you're using one of these tools for anonymization, like um, I think actually Co Council has the ability to do this. Ours we have we have the ability to do that in our product. But basically, you have to check the model. Um, it could be a, it could be a you know a serious violation uh, on there if you're uploading really sensitive information and. That information is all treating its model on there. There's really no point in anonymization um, in that case if you're basically sharing all that data. So uh, it's a good question. It is one that I think is um, is uh, is is going to depend on the product um, that you're using on there. But it's um, that's when you have to any of these tools you have to be really sensitive um, to what it does with your data and what kind of protections uh, you have um, as far as putting in. Um, confidential data. Um, I'm interested in how you input these documents. Do you upload PDFs into Chat GPT? What are the options in more detail, please? So this one is Stephen Howard, uh, Stephen Tower. So it really kind of depends on. First of all, it depends on what kind of document you're uploading. So if it's a document that is, you don't really care about confidentiality, like 
you just gotten a you know your a court case that was published on the court's website and you are uploading you, you can go into chat gpt for example and upload well maybe you'll hit the uh, the the token limits on it so it might not be the best example but you're uploading that document you don't really care about confidentiality because there's no con there's no client information or anything that that is producing for you so that might be a tool you can use for that um adobe acrobat pro has is one of the products that uh, i was talking about before which now have generative ai features um and you have a, a lot of law firms uh are using adobe acrobat and obviously in the acrobat cloud there are a lot of protections on uh, privacy of data that uh, the law firms are posting into the cloud. Um, so that might be an example of what you can use to upload a PDF and be able to get those uh, kind of answers that you would want with generative AI, or you can use a legal specific tool uh, on there. So, um, you know, like I said, co- Lexis and co-counsel, I'm pretty sure I have both. I know co-counsel has uh, the ability to upload PDFs and have it do summarizations um, and, uh, like, a, uh, the, like I said, there are other products in lo- legal that are out there, including ours. Um, but that's, uh, the, the answer on that is you do have a, you have a number of choices that you can use. Your factors are going to be, do they protect confidentiality and can they handle a larger document on there? If it is a larger document. So that's uh, a couple of things to keep in mind. Also, what is it that you're doing? So sometimes you're uploading a document, a PDF. Are you just trying to summarize it or actually are you performing tasks on it, like trying to get analysis out of it or have it do certain things? So um, it's going to, you know, the tool you're using uh, may make a difference on uh, depending on the task you're trying to accomplish. Okay. Uh, Somebody asked, some prompts included client names. Is there an issue with confidentiality or data security and putting client names? So kind of, again, the same theme. It could be uh, an issue. Um, depending on uh, which tool you're using. But you definitely need to, if you're planning on using these for client-related tasks in your in your law firm, you need to be using tools that have a, that are specifically um, designed to preserve confidentiality uh, on there. And if you, uh, if it's not obvious to you, like it's not obvious in the terms of service, you need to be really careful uh, on there. But there are tools. There are a lot of a lot of law firms and a lot of law firms that have chief ethics officers and all kinds of people like that that are using these kinds of tools. And they, uh, they, they, there are tools that will satisfy those issues. And then there are some that you should be really careful about uh, on there. So, um, ChatGPT. By the way, there's like five different versions of ChatGPT with different levels of um, of data um, security and data privacy in there. And so you should know which version of chat GPT you're looking at. I actually, there's a, and not in this presentation, I have another one, a um, kind of an, an illustration of what the, the each version of chat GPT uh, does as far as client confidentiality goes. So if anybody is like not really sure about, uh, you know, that they want that slide. I'm happy to send that as well. Just ask me uh, by email and I'll send it to you. So next question I have is, how do AI tools that are currently available compare to traditional research methods in terms of accuracy and efficiency? Um, it's a fair question and a good question on there. So they each kind of have their strength. Um, for a uh, an AI, I mean, for sort of a, I guess the um, traditional legal research, online legal research tools, those are probably better from a browsing perspective. For example, if you sort of like know what you're just you're 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 just looking to you know like you were going to a library and you were you know what you were looking for and you were just trying to find what you're looking for and get the precise text. I think those tools can be better for that. Those tools also are not going to hallucinate, um, but they have a different problem with the traditional tools hallucinating being like making you know like giving you an inaccurate answer or producing some putting something in a legal memo uh, that is producing for you that may not be. Um, the best answer on there. Um, so the problem that the traditional tools have is that they um, oftentimes will give you three or four hundred response, you know, like hits on a particular search, um, and it can be really difficult to find what you're looking for because you haven't given it the precise keywords or the precise la- the language that it's looking for. 
um, in which case you may end up and, and you may end up also sort of being misled by the legal by the re- online research as well, where you did not do a, a good job in terms of shaping the uh, the Boolean search that you're doing um, and may not be getting the best answer. So I think if, you know, in an ideal world, it, in the, it, it, I think people now are sort of romanticizing a little bit about traditional legal research that it's always been so good. But if you've been using it for a lot of years, you know, um, you know, you'll get a lot of garbage responses with uh, traditional legal research and you'll waste a lot of time with that. So it's not, that's not perfect either. Um, I think with generative AI, it, my, my preference is to still use, is to use a generative AI product because in a lot of cases I will find in the citations, um, even if I'm, I don't trust anything that I'm getting out of generative AI as far as being accurate. Um, but it usually puts me on the right track as far as getting an answer almost instantly. Um, and I'll look in the citations. And then once I start looking at cited documents, I'll have a much better handle on the topic than I did before. It is just a lot faster and easier to get to that point. Um, so I would say that, uh, you know, you should think about, um, using both sets of tools, depending on the circumstance, what you're trying to do. I do think actually, I can just tell you from our own experience of designing a legal research tool, albeit in the immigration space, um, that we had a, uh, because we did this with the American Immigration Lawyers Association, there was about 40 immigration lawyers that they had recruited that were essentially giving us feedback on answers as it was coming in. And we, we did a lot of tweaking to the prompts to get better and better responses. We made a lot of adjustments. You know, we, we had to add in a lot of content that in areas where we were a little bit weaker to improve things. We, we ended up, uh, I think at the end of the day, uh, and we also had a score set up where until we got to a certain score, as far as like we, we did it zero for, completely wrong 0.5 if it was sort of right but not but either incomplete or maybe had some elements that were weren't the best and then one for a great answer uh on there and we were not going to uh release the product until we had a at least on average um a 0.8 um and now we're at over 0.9 now i tell people because every once in a while an immigration lawyer you know that'll come up to me and say Love the product. It did get this one question uh, wrong on there, and I'm like, "Well, I said we know that's going to happen one out of ten times that would they the product that the answer is not going to be great, and which is why you still have to be the lawyer." And I'll tell people, you know, all that any of the research products are using, whether it's traditional or AI, uh, is that you still have to be the lawyer. You still have to read the cases that it's presenting. You still have to. Do you know? Do that analysis. That uh, is what your clients are expecting of you. So hopefully that's helpful. Uh, I'm trying to see where I am in the questions. Um, what steps should a law firm take to develop and implement an AI use policy that ensures um, compliance? Can I can I do a share of my AI use policy? Um, I'm going to do that real fast because I think it might be helpful for people. Um, to see that. So let me pull that document up and then I'll share in a second. Okay. Do you see? Yep. Okay. So this is our AI use policy. At the beginning of it, it's sort of like it just explains, you know, what it, what, that we've introduced ChatGPT and why we're using it and what the purpose of it is. Uh, then it sets, you know, sort of out the, the scope. But then we explain to people that we're going to, they're going to have to go through a training if they're going to use the tech in the office. And we kind of tell them what we're going to be training them on. Uh, then we list out the appropriate uses, um, that they can, uh, that they can use it for. Um, and then the things that would be prohibited, uh, on there, which should be obvious, uh, on there about some of this stuff, but maybe not necessarily to everybody. Um, and then the uh, explaining to them that uh, about hallucinations and not relying on anything that they get too closely in there. And then we talk about data security, uh, liability, sort of all the scary things that we want people to be thinking about before they're using these tools. Um, and then letting them know that we are monitoring how it's being used um, at the uh, in there, so that I think people sort of understand that there's a uh, that, that that that's something that. Uh, and then also letting them know that the technology is changing a lot. 
and we uh, will probably come back and, re and review and make changes to this policy more so than we might on other kinds of uh, policies that are out there. Um, and then this is the um, the training uh, hour that I was describing before about how much time we spend on each of the topics on there, but it just sort of makes it re easy for the person in the office who's going to be doing the training to understand what topics are going to be covered. Uh, a list of the materials and resources that uh, the, um, the paralegal, or the uh, attorney, or whoever's taking the course is going to have that is going to get, uh, and what's attached to the policy, um, and then how we're going to be following up. So that is a uh, that's the um, RAI use policy. Like I said, I'll send it to anybody that wants it. But that's a um, one that I think uh, covers a lot of ground in there, and. Um, I've gotten a lot of good feedback. I shared this with a lot of firms that uh, are, are using something or version of this uh, in their practices. So I think it, it hits a lot of the topics. Um, somebody asked me a question on AI tools, what I would recommend for optimizing time management and scheduling. So this is like my biggest frustration with Microsoft Copilot is what I was really hoping Copilot could do um, is is do a lot more with the um, Outlook calendar uh, on there, and it doesn't seem to do much uh, on the calendar side. It does a good job. It's like summarizing emails and helping you draft emails and all that. What I would like, uh, and I don't know, Google has sort of figured this out on their version of calendar. What I would, what I'm hoping will be happening, you know, in the near future is that you can have basically, if you get an email. Uh, from a client to, to, you know, go, is, is, what I'd like is that you could just basically say, um, let's schedule a meeting. I'm available next week. Um, and then have the, the, with, the, since you're comprising that response in Microsoft and you can see your calendar to have it actually take the next, you know, it, it is to take the steps of, uh, of showing you maybe on the right hand of like all the spots that are available in your calendar. And then maybe clicking on it and having the uh, automatically sending a calendar invite attached to the email response or that kind of thing. The answer is I don't, I'm not aware of anybody that's doing a good job in that right now. Um, but it is I feel your pain if that's what you're hoping that you're going to be able to get out of it because I would like to get that functionality and I don't have it yet um, as far as that goes. But um, somebody's asking a specific question about. Uh, oh, I guess it's copyright um, on here. So it is a, uh, that's a fair question to ask regarding copyright and you need to kind of pay attention right now to, I, I'm not aware of any um, suits against an end user, um, but it seems to be the suits that are out there. So the New York Times has a suit that they have filed. Sarah Silverman, the comedian, has a suit she's filed and there's some others that are out there where they are suing the language models. Um, and But it is a fluid area as far as uh, that goes. And I, I would say that the, um, you know, I, I think you sort of have to, right at this point, I'm not aware of anybody that's gotten into trouble for on the drafting side. I think it's been more on music and on art uh, that it seems like right now that, but it is something to stay on top of as far as this litigation goes. Um, I would that New York Times suit has been out for quite a while. Uh, there have also been some, like, I think um, the Wall Street Journal and uh, News Corp just signed, I think, a, like a, I forget how many millions of dollars, like a $20 million agreement um, with, maybe it was OpenAI, I can't remember if it was OpenAI or Google, to allow for their content to basically train. And what's happening is that these, some of these big content providers are are giving are getting paid substantial money to give their data to help train the AI, and then the AI tools are also then featuring that content in their answers. So it's sort of a good from both a financial point of view for the um, the, the content provider as well as also um, getting people to uh, uh, to go onto their sites, for example. Um, but that's something I would say be that it's a good question and, and and stay tuned. I would guess that if the courts start hammering people on that, that Congress will step in because it's, I think at this point, kind of like 
you may remember e-commerce from back in the day when it started. You didn't pay sales tax probably for the good first five, five or eight or 10 years um, that people were buying stuff on Amazon and those kind of places. And that was deliberate policy to kind of foster and make sure that these technologies would be allowed to develop. I would guess that if there start to be you know serious copyright enforcement that's reaching the users or making these products not work as well, um, that Congress is probably going to provide some protections in that regard. But that's just my guess. Um, somebody asked a question, are there uh, any um, tools that are good at reviewing documents uh, that were photocopied, such as IEPs from school districts? Um, photocopy, so like I said, the uh, that's one of the... Um, to, that's one of the things that's gotten a lot better um, in these tools since they, uh, November 2022 when GPT 3.5 was released. The newer ones um, do a very good job uh, on there. First, what they will do is they will, I mean, they they, they will do image rec, you know, convert to digital text, and then it will start answering questions from that. But I've personally done a lot of experimenting with that. I do um, a lot of I have a lot of family tree documents and things like that that are poor quality documents um, that also some of them are hand handwritten and language, you know, and sort of about 18th century or 19th century fanciful writing and all that and would be hard. I have trouble even understanding it, looking at it myself, but um, it does a, uh, it, it does quite a good job. I think one of the things that made the biggest impression on me in that respect was um, when GPT-4 was released last year, last spring, um, in one of the demo videos that OpenAI did, somebody designed a website on the back of a napkin just with a pen, and they just kind of like designed what they wanted it to look like. Then they took a picture of it with their phone and uploaded the image, and it designed it. It was able to take that and design it. So it's it is it it's it is a much higher level than what we've seen in the past as far as uh, image recognition. Um, from programs that uh, you know, we at our law firm, we've been uh, almost finished with this five-year project where we were at 30 years of files that we were we were digitizing so that we can um, destroy the paper files. Uh, and we had a out we had a 900 boxes of files that uh, were at an outside storage facility. Uh, and I can tell you that uh, we had OCR and it wasn't great. Um, but it was good. I mean, good enough on there that it could be you figure things out. But in a lot of cases, it was a uh, far from perfect. Um, these new tools, I think, are a lot better and have taken that uh, taken things to a much higher level. Um, where can you find a copy of the prompts that I use? So, Nina, how do they? Uh, I mean, I, I'm happy to email anybody my slides, but Nina, I think you said you guys were going to make them available. So, how does that work? Yeah, so you can go to the webinar page that you use to register for today's presentation, and they will be available for download. So you will have them. Um, and yeah, I've been plenty of presentations where I have my camera and taking pictures of what I'm seeing on the screen and all that. So um, I know that's a pain in the neck. So you should have everything you need. If for some reason you need, if I mention anything um, that you have, a, you know, a document or anything like that, I'm happy to send it. I have a also, one I've been sending out to people um, is uh, sample language for your retainer agreement on disclosing to clients how you're using generative AI and having those conversations. I'm happy to send that. So um, just let me know, and I will uh, I'll hit reply and send you what you asked for. Thanks for watching. We hope you enjoyed this video. And if you did enjoy it, please hit the like button and subscribe to our channel for more videos on law practice and legal marketing. See you in our next clip. Bye.